So there is a question that I am asked nearly every month a few times. It's the most question, it's the most asked question that I get as a pastor from Christians, okay? So not the most a- uh, asked question from, from somebody who's seeking the Lord, someone who has committed uh, to the Lord. And that question is, why am I here? They don't say it necessarily like that. They say it in different ways, but that is the question. Why am I here? And they don't mean why am I here on earth? Um, that's a good question, but a different question. They mean why did God put me in this place and this time? Uh, and why is my life like this? And actually underneath that as well, why is my life like this? There's a, a, a feeling of, you know, this has been kind of a weird and strange life God has given me. I'm not sure I approve, you know. Why am I here, you know? Why, 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 why am I in this place? Why is it like this? Um, and uh, tell me, uh, Tim, what you think, yeah? Um, now, most people uh, are often unsatisfied with the answer to the question when I, when I give answers. So I'm a lousy um, uh, fortune teller as it is, all right? Now, we're in a series that is designed to tell you, in some sense, the answer to that question. Why am I here? So we're going through a series, where do we go from here? Sounds familiar. God wants to take us on a journey. He wants to make our lives into something beautiful, each uniquely, not all the same place necessarily, but we're all on a, on a journey, a journey that God wants us to go on, that is, if we choose Uh, to let him. We have to choose to let God take us on the journey that he wants to do and not just uh, meander about the countryside looking for our own meaning. And so will we let God take us on that journey? Well, how? How do we do that? The answer is by surrendering to God and surrendering to these tools that he has given us to grow us and shape us into all we're meant to be. And so we've looked at several of these tools and um, we're going to come back to this idea. If you apply these tools, it will change your life. It's going to change everything about you if you will apply these things. So, so what are they? Uh, this is the next slide here. Oh, we hit that one. One more. What are the tools? Uh, first, we said this, God's word. Go well, not just by reading, but by loving and leaning on God's word. So God doesn't want you to make yourself read. He wants you to love what's in his word. Go well by loving God's word. Go well not by praying your wants. I want this, I want that, I want the other thing, and by the way, you've messed this whole thing up, God. Don't pray your wants, pray God's will. Okay, that's the second second tool. We have word, we have prayer, and then go well, not by forcing yourself to obey, but by lovingly responding to God with love. Go well, not by forcing yourself to obey, because you you don't think this is going to be any fun if you obey. Respond to God's love with love. Then last week, go well by not going alone, but gladly going together with uh, those who are seeking the Lord. And so God has given us each other to help us to get where we need to go. You cannot go on the journey that you're supposed to go alone. You need other people. Behold, other people are here for you. Okay, this is what we call church. Go together. Now, we're resuming today, and I think this is going to be the biggest answer to this question. Why am I here? Why am I here? I want you to think about heaven for a second. Close your eyes, think about heaven. Okay? Is it good? (laughs) Is it good? Chances are, the idea that you came up with in your head, you could stop, is a place that is strangely maybe not that good. Listen, heaven is going to be far better than you could possibly ever imagine. Uh, The the earth's great delights are heaven's rubbish bin. Okay, Nobody does that in heaven because it's so much better. Now, if God loves us, then why hasn't he zapped us up straight to heaven as soon as we met him? Isn't that, that's a good question, right? If heaven is so good, and that's where we're going, I know we're not convinced that heaven is so good, but the moment we die, we'll know that it is so good and that we should have come, right? We wanted to come here as soon as possible. But if it's so good, then why doesn't God say, well, now that you're a believer, come on up. Vacation is on forever. 
The answer is that God has given us a very important mission while we wait. We are waiting, and God has said there's an important mission, and the mission is I want you now, who I've invited to heaven, to go out and invite others too. Don't just sit there. Here's a good question. Are you going to heaven? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Good. Who is going with you? Are you going to go to heaven alone? Just you straight through the door? You didn't tell anybody else about the party? You didn't tell anybody else about the glory and the beauty? I sure hope that none of us will feel that on the day that we meet the Lord. I wish that I could have invited someone else to come. Big idea today. Go well by inviting others to know the same love you received. Go well by inviting others to know the same love you received. So let's start by noting that God has actually commanded us to invite others. Okay, he's commanded us to invite. Now this, it turns out, is something that people debate a lot. So theologians uh, and actually people who don't want to do evangelism, they debate quite a bit that they don't have to do evangelism. Okay, here's how it goes. They say... It's mostly not theologians, by the way. It's, it's mostly just people not wanting to do evangelism. They say, listen, it's not my spiritual gift. Have you ever read Ephesians 4.11? I can tell you it says that there are evangelists there. So look, there's a spiritual gift of evangelism. That means I clearly don't have that gift. So, uh, and besides, I really don't want to do that. So let's let that person handle the, the sharing the good news. As for me, I like having a nice cup of tea and just sitting around with some friends. And that's what I'll do, okay? Let's consider Jesus' last words to the disciples before he rose. Matthew 28, 18. Does everybody know it? Who knows it? 28, 18. Go into all the world and make disciples. Okay, we'll come back to what disciples might be. Go uh, of, of who? You said the nations. Disciples of the nations or disciples of the, the pagans. That's the nations. It just means somebody who doesn't know God. The other people outside of God's kingdom. Go to people who don't know God and make disciples of those people, teaching them to... What'd you say? I heard something. Observe. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Okay, so that was all on my head. I, don't, I hope I didn't mess it up. But listen, lo, I am with to the ends of the age. So... Somebody follows that up with, well, that's for the disciples, isn't it? Well, I mean, if it's for the disciples, then why does he say, I'm with you to the end of the age? Because they died. <laughs> the age didn't expire. It, it goes on. It hasn't, it hasn't ended yet. Uh, in fact, uh, Matthew 24, 24, I'll just read it to you. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Here's what God is saying to you. I have this mission, and here's how the mission works. After every tribe and every people, everyone upon this earth, after they all hear the great news that Jesus loves us, that God has loved us and died for us in Christ, after they hear that message and, and all the people are invited to a great feast, then I will return. That hasn't happened yet. Which means that those promises there, like, I will be with you. No one has a problem with saying, the Lord will be with me. That's a great thing. I will be with you. Those are ours. But also the command, go and make disciples. That command is for you. Now, you can't make disciples <laughs> unless you tell them about what is this good message that we have. That's how it starts. You go to someone who knows nothing of God and you say to them, can I share about what's going on in my life and what I found this incredible thing? It, it will not happen unless we actually open our mouth and talk about Jesus and also something else. We're going to see that in a minute. We have to show the gospel in two uh, primary ways. Uh, the other day I was uh, talking to a lady and she said, um, I heard some funny things about a man on a tree. Okay, <laughs> That's what she said. I heard some funny things about a man on a tree. She'd never heard the gospel, there's work to do. By the way, if somebody says something like that, what you say is, I'd love to tell you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd love to tell you about that man. I know something about that man on the tree. Okay, so that's point number one. 
Let's now consider two important ways of inviting God into, inviting others into God's love. First, we invite by what we do. This one's important. Everybody focuses on this one, but this is really important. So let's turn to Matthew 5.13. How do I share the gospel? We share it by inviting by what we do. And we can start in verse 13. You've heard it already. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. So there are two pictures, salt and light here. And they are pictures of things that believers have that nobody else has. Okay, you, ev not everyone in the world has salt. Not everyone in the world has light. It's a special gift from God into the life of believers. And God is saying, take that thing and use it. Don't lose it. Don't lose this important thing that I have <coughs> given you. So we'll talk about salt first. In this culture, they didn't have refrigerators. Shocking things you're finding out this morning, okay? So when this was spoken, no refrigerators. But they did have meat, and so this caused a problem because if you want to keep meat for any time whatsoever, you're going to need to uh, keep it fresh somehow. And so what they did to keep it fresh is they salted it. They salted it, and it preserved the meat. It took out the moisture so it didn't rot. It was a preservative, and so this is why if you go to your local grocery store, still today you can have basically raw meat that's been salted, okay? Um, this is the ancient tradition. Salt is important. Without salt, we got no food. And so he says, you are the preservative of the world. Not, not that you have that in of yourself, but that God has given you this thing, this salt, right? And so what the Israelites would do is there was the Dead Sea, uh, and that's just a, just a bit down from Jerusalem. It's this huge uh, lake that is filled with nothing but water. Nothing gets out of it. And so it's become very, very salty. And this is actually a good thing. I have a picture of it here. Um, doesn't that look nice? You'd think you want to go in there, but it's really gross, actually. And you just feel nasty when you're in, in the salt, salt dead sea, just so everybody knows. Uh, but anyway, they would go in there and they would chip out some of that rock there, which is not just salt. It's actually a lot of stuff. And they'd put it on their wagon and they'd make their way back up the hill. Or um, it, this is really famous. So people would come around from all over the world to get this salt. And they would, they would go and they would use that as their preservative or whatever else they wanted uh, to do with it. But if it rained and it was uncovered, then the rain would fall on the salt and it would leach off. And all you'd be left with is all those minerals and no salt. And then it's just a pile of worthless stuff. God says that that can happen to you. That he can give you a priceless gift and you can say, I'm going to hide this. I'm not going to use this. And you could lose it. You could lose your saltiness if that's possible, if it's possible. So this is actually a, a warning. Don't become a worthless rock, <laughs> right? Keep the salt of Christ. Well, what is the salt? The salt is Jesus' his love, his mercy, his kindness lived out. The salt is everything that Jesus has done for us being lived out. Um, God, God says, don't lose that. Keep exercising love and mercy and grace because I have loved you. Don't let go of that. Perhaps you know Christians and they are called Christians, but you couldn't tell. They don't do anything unique. And you know what God says about that individual? He's got a big plan for the whole world, but there's a guy who doesn't want to live for the Lord. And God says, well, I can't do anything with that. I'll just, I'm not going to put him in my plan. I'll just use somebody else over there. That person's willing to be used. I'll use that one. Don't let that happen. Um, and the way you don't let that happen is you let God's love challenge you to love others. Now, remember, we had a lesson called personal holiness. So go back and look at that lesson on personal holiness. That's actually what you need to do. Keep fresh in God's love and you will go and share God's love. Now, listen, think about a gospel track for a moment. So you guys have seen those little gospel tracks. 
they're really good. Have you, has anyone else noticed that these are like very good statements of our faith? You open it up and it says exactly the right thing. They've worked real hard on it. And that gospel track will change absolutely nobody unless they encounter a real gospel track, a tangible gospel track, a gospel track with hands and feet. And so if you don't love someone, they're not going to be loved from the Lord. If you don't show kindness and mercy, they won't receive the kindness and mercy of the Lord. This is how it works. This is how salt preserves. It is used. Okay? And so it's actually, if you think about this, it's one thing to know the ocean is vast and huge. We, we shared this in a prayer meeting once. It's another to be swept up in the ocean. Have you ever been caught in the waves of the ocean and then you realize, wow, this thing is big and powerful? Living out God's love helps people to feel the breeze of heaven, to feel and to smell the ocean of grace. Okay, you're the means for them to go from head knowledge, I have a tract, into here is the gospel lived out, and I know that Jesus is real because God's love is present in them. Now, let's think about light of the world, salt and light. Uh, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. This is the city on the hill. So they would have been able to see this when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and it lights up during the night, and it's just down the road. So they would see this particular city, and it would just light up, and you couldn't miss it. If you are walking around the uh, Galilee, and you're trying to find a city during the night, it's pretty easy, okay? You know the way home, it's lit up. And Jesus says, we need to be like that. And then he gives an example. Don't hide your light. Don't put it under a basket. Don't take your light. Who takes a flashlight and then takes, you know, a basket and puts it on top of it so it can't be useful, to anybody. It's actually a very selfish thing to do. I have the light, but I'm not going to share it with anybody else. God says, take the light I've given you and reflect it to somebody else. Surely you've done that, or you've taken, you know, like a mirror and you've reflected onto somebody's face. <laughs> do that with God's love. Do that with God's love. Here's our verse, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others. They may see your good deeds. They may glorify your Father in heaven. What is this light? What is this salt? It's God's love lived out. And God tells you, he's saying, go and live out your love. Why? Because otherwise, people will never know me. They will never glorify my Father in heaven. Go and live out your light. Go and live out the love that God has given. Reflect that love through tangible deeds. And at least outdo your neighbors, for goodness sakes. Have you guys noticed this? That there are people who do not believe in the Lord, and they are very interested in looking like they have things together, and they're actually nicer than the Christians are. Have you guys noticed this? Have you noticed this? I, I have a neighbor who's extremely nice. He puts me to shame. God says, listen, you are not living out my love. This is a challenge for you. That person doesn't even have God and they feel like they should love others. You have me. You have the cross. Go and live it out. That's point number one. The first way we share good news is through changed and loving behavior. Your neighbors need you. Your neighbors need you. You are the expression of God's love for them. Don't neglect them. Next point. The second way we invite is speaking as ambassadors, and we use words. Okay? We speak as ambassadors, and we use words. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 16. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter five. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. 
All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Let's think about three new things in this passage, okay? First new thing is we are a new creation. Well, we're part of the new creation. Uh, and so what he says is, is we don't regard people according to the flesh or to the world. We don't live for ourselves anymore. And so if you're in Christ, you have a whole different way of living. The whole world walks around and does whatever they want to do all day long. That's how they function. They, they do things for themselves. They do things quite selfishly. At the end of it, it is a payoff to them. And God says, you have been born anew into a new creation where that rule doesn't apply anymore. You're now a servant. You're now, well, we'll talk about it, an ambassador. So, so stop hanging out in the world and saying, I thrive in the world when what you thrive in is in heaven. <laughs> Don't be something that you're not. That won't work anymore for you. Anybody else met the Lord? You had a whole host of sins that you enjoyed before you met the Lord and you met him uh, and he changed your life. And then all of a sudden, all these things that you used to enjoy just feel terrible, okay? Because it doesn't work for you anymore. You're new, new life, new creation. You also have a new job. And the job is called reconciler. Doesn't sound um, particularly great, does it? You're a reconciler. Here's what it means. Suppose that someone has hurt you badly and never says they're sorry and never makes up for whatever they did, right? They, maybe they took, it ended up costing you a, a fortune. They never make it right at all. And so years pass by, and then one day you realize you just never seen them for years. Oh, and they did that thing, and they never apologized. And you say, you know what? It is not worth throwing away this friendship. And you actually, you swallow the debt that you lost, and you go to them and say, listen, I don't even want to, I'm going to forgive you for that. I, just come back into fellowship with me. I, I just want to be your friend. That's what God did for you. You say, that's what God did for you. We are all sinners, and God went the distance to come and save us. Us sinners didn't change our ways and say, God, now, will you now accept us? God says, I I'm going to pay for this. And so Christ has died for us to bring us into the presence of God because he really actually, he loves us. And then he says, to do that for other people help them to be reconciled to me as i've already been reconciled to you 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 go do what has been done for you that's what you do from now on have you thought about how that would change your behavior as you are talking with individuals to think to myself this conversation is actually not a much about me it's about them and it's specifically about getting them to be closer to the Lord who loves them, bringing them back into a relationship with God. We are reconcilers. That is our job. Remember what I said? Why are we here? We are here to help the world come back into a relationship with the Lord. That is why you're still on earth. It's your new job here. And we're the best sort of sales maker. There are salesmen that are really annoying, and they're really annoying because what they sell you, they don't care for themselves, and you know it, <laughs> okay? So here they are telling you about this great product. I, I love, I, I go to restaurants. In America, you can do this. You can say, what's on the menu? What do you like, right? And they'll say, I like this or I like that. Here you say that, and they're like, just order your food already. I don't know. It's, 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 I don't know what the deal is. It's, it's very unlikely, you know? And, and um <laughs> And still, there's tipping. It's kind of crazy, okay? <laughs> so just, just order your food already. Um, but you say, what's on the menu? What do you like? And I've asked that question several times in, in America. And they look at me and they're like, I like this item. And you just totally know that they don't like anything on the menu. They, don't, they wouldn't eat here if they had the choice. Have you ever seen that happen? You go to eat something and you look in the back and they're having their lunch and it's from a different place. They got like pizza from the place <laughs> next door. That, that's like a lot of Christians. Oh, man, I don't want to share the gospel. I don't even like the gospel. I don't even want to give people this. I don't even, I don't even partake of this myself. And God says, actually, it, there's nothing better than somebody who says, listen, I want you to have this. 
It's going to cost your life. But you know what? I couldn't think more of Jesus Christ on the cross. And you know what? I am his number one fan. And guess what? I needed this myself. And I have it every day. Okay? When, when you find someone who really actually loves what they're selling and what they're selling is really good and valuable, then you go, okay, wait a minute. Now, think about this, actually. You see, why does anybody not want to come to Christ when they look out at us and they see that we're totally uninterested too? <laughs> but we should be interested. It is the power to change us. It is the power to change them. And we are going to the most wonderful places. You are a reconciler. Are you reconciling? Now, new behavior is the last one. So we have three news. New creation, uh, new job, and new behavior. And the new behavior is we speak out this news. Okay, It says here that we are ambassadors. And God is imploring through us. And this is true. Okay, God is using us to speak out his message. That's his plan of getting the word out is that he takes all the broken people, and the broken people walk around and say, I was broken, but I can be fixed in Christ, and you can be fixed in Christ too. That's the plan. Because that's way better than having a perfect human being who never makes any mistakes, because that guy, they're just going to kill. That's what happened with Jesus. Yeah? So then God says, I have a better plan. I'll take these broken people, and they'll just walk around and say, I was broken, and Jesus fixed me. Are you broken? You look broken. Jesus can fix you too. We are ambassadors. Now, here's the thing. If any one of you received a phone call from Her Majesty, okay, I would like you to be an ambassador, you know, even if you said no, which would be kind of crazy. But if you said, uh, let's just, even if you said no, you would be what? Proud. Oh, man, that is something that I would do. Well, you are an ambassador of a much bigger kingdom than this little island, than this little ocean. <laughs> This place is nothing. God's kingdom is forever, and you're an ambassador. Be proud. Walk in it. Unashamed. But listen, there is no such thing as a silent ambassador. There is no such thing as a silent ambassador. An ambassador who doesn't tell anybody about the kingdom that he lives in uh, and doesn't invite. He just keeps quiet. He doesn't even speak for his kingdom. There is no such thing as a silent ambassador. Are you a silent ambassador? Are you a silent ambassador? You are going to have to speak plainly the good news. You're going to have to say the truth about what has changed your life. You're going to have to talk about the one who saved you. And this is part of what you are now. And it's okay. I know, it's scary, and it's terrifying, and what's going to happen? Well, here's what's going to happen. Sometimes they're not going to receive it, and it'll go badly. But actually, even when it goes badly, God says it's for good. It'll be okay. But what, if my friends know I'm one of those weirdo Christians, they'll think I'm weird. Well, you are weird. You were so desperate, you needed grace, and God gave it to you, and this is a good message. And it's okay if some of them don't understand. Speak up. One thing on this, um, um, it's good to have a simple explanation in your head of what is the God has done for you, okay? So you can say something like, when I was young, I was, this is true of me, when I was young, I was suicidal, I wasn't a good person, I knew I wasn't a good person, and then I met Jesus who helps people who aren't good people, and he died for me, and I thought, if you want to try to help me, I'll give my life to you. And he totally changed my life. And today I'm a pastor, and it's crazy. Okay? So you, you get that one sentence, and, and if you have that prepared, at least you, you have something you can fall back on. You're so scared, you don't know what to say. Well, I have my one sentence. I can say that if I need to. Okay? Uh, so that's a little last point. All right, so that's our message this morning. Go well by inviting others to know the same love you've received. Uh, I got three specific ways we can conclude this section, Okay? Uh, and, and, and think about how, how, how things change for us. So the first is start with the first three steps that we've had. So everybody remember the first three tools that God has given us. Read about God's word, read God's word, love God's word, accept God's word, pray back God's will to him. God, I want this thing that I just read to be the case in the world. Um, and then uh, don't just pray it to God. Go out and reflect God's love and do what he asks you to do. 
if you will do those three things, then the evangelism is going to take care of itself. Really, it will. You can just don't even worry about half the things I've said. If you are willing to pray, uh, to, to read God's word, to love it, to pray God, uh, your will be done. I want to see your kingdom come. And then to want to go and live for the Lord. Well, God says the best way you can live for me is by going out and loving others nonstop. And par perhaps you'll get the opportunity to invite them to come into the kingdom. You'll be excited about that. So if you'll do these first three steps in our series, this step will be taken care of too. Will you do the first three steps? Because if you come to this series and you hear that you can do all these things and it will turn your life around and then you don't do any of these things day by day by day, you've missed out on the blessing that God has for you. And I'm going to remind you of this next week. Uh, we have a sermon. Please do not walk away and say, I'm not going to wake up in the morning and read my Bible and I'm not going to pray in the morning and I'm not going to do what God says. That's not the appropriate response to this. The appropriate response is keep going with God. This is the natural next reaction. I live for the kingdom, which means I'm sharing Jesus' love today. It'll take care of itself. Number two, make it a priority. Actually, you should think to yourself, well, would it be so great if I got to share the love of Christ with someone today? Actually, it's really nice to think about what you could do. I could do something for someone today and they will pay me back nothing for it. They won't give me a thing. I could surprise them. Hmm, I know that person needs help with their computer. I'll go do it, okay? I know this person needs this situation. I'll take care of it. And then just say, this is just to bless you. And they'll be like, bless me how? Do you believe in God? What's going on? You know, this is the sort of thing that you can begin to relish. I can go and love somebody for nothing because Christ has loved me. So put it on your list. Think about it. Third one, pray specifically. So here's what I mean by that. Um, when I was a youth pastor, I had this incredible time. I'm always trying to go back to the youth pastor days where God was moving powerfully, okay? And what would happen is for a number of years, I would see kids just show up to my youth group. I don't know how they got the invite, okay? I have no idea how these people would come. And they would come to my youth group and then what would happen is um, I would think about them a lot and I would pray about them a lot. I'd be like, Lord, help this person. I would just focus on one, maybe two at most people. They'd come into my youth group, I'd see them and I'd start to pray for them. I'd be like, Lord, please lead this person to you. Lord, please help your will to be done in their life. Lord, da 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 da. I would do this and guess what? Like after a month, man, they would probably meet the Lord. Okay, this, this is just the way it worked when everything was, the spirit was overflowing. I don't know what was going on, but, but as I prayed specifically, then God would enable me to be uh, there for them and to lead them to the Lord. I bet you that if you pray specifically that way, God will do that for you, for someone too. And then guess what? You won't have to go to heaven alone. <laughs> Let's pray.